Hey, hey, it's Shay Keister, and I'm your host for the Casual Cattle Conversations podcast, where we connect you to ranchers and beef industry enthusiasts who can help you build a more profitable operation and improve your lifestyle. Are you looking for a community of ranchers who support and challenge you to be more profitable and proactive? Then sign up for our monthly Rancher Mind events. Rancher Minds are mastermind events for ranchers to come together once a month and find solutions for their own and the industry's challenges. Stay connected by following Cattle Convos on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, and never miss an episode or event update by signing up for our newsletter on casualcattleconversations.com slash newsletter. If you get value out of this episode or any episode, drop a comment or tip me by using the link in the show notes. With that, let's see who our guest is today and connect you to a new resource to improve your own operation and lifestyle. Hey folks, thanks for coming back to another episode of Casual Cattle Conversations. Today we are visiting with Cassie Laposotis and we are going to do some feedlot talk and visit about, you know, what ranchers can do to help their calves perform a little better in the feedlot, talk about what happens when calves enter the feedlot, and really even go into some big picture things as far as technology in the beef industry and just hear Cassie's perspective. She's a cow-calf owner, she's a feedlot owner, and she has a great attitude and unique perspective about the beef industry. She was on my Rancher Mind call, the feedlot one, a few months ago, or a month, probably it was March. So not that long ago, actually. Time flies, I guess. But with that, let's hear what Cassie has to say and get on with the episode. Thank you for joining me today on the show. I know you've been a part of the Rancher Mind series, which was awesome to have you on the feedlot side. And uh, so I'm excited to have you on this other end of casual cattle conversations. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. So just to start off, would you please share what your background is within the beef industry? What's, what's your beef story? Um, sure. So, um, my parents, um, so my dad's side of the family, um, their Greek family that came over, um, immigrated from Greece, um, started working his way over on the railroads and then ended up in Bridgeport, Nebraska with, um, buying some farm ground and we started as farmers back in the 70s and then um my dad in 1988 decided to build a feedlot here west of Bridgeport so he built the feedlot that I'm working at and managing today um so it's been you know 33 34 years now that that feedlot's been in operation and then on my mom's side of the family um her dad uh, raised registered Herefords and they'd have um, bull sales every year and they're just about 18 miles southwest of Bridgeport and um, oh back in the 90s my mom ended up buying that ranch from my grandpa and she turned the sale barn into a feedlot and built it up to about a 5,000 head yard feed yard and then um, she had a cow herd that they would run back in the hills. So my background would be growing up, uh, working summers with my dad or my mom um, through, you know, the fall run and the in the fall and winter time uh, weekends would be spent uh, processing, uh, writing pens, um, helping her out when she was kind of shorthanded. And um, so it's kind of a combination of the two, but a lot of it was out of my mom's and then a lot of my summer times were irrigating here in town with my dad. So um, just been a part of my life as far as I can remember. And um, it's been good. It's been a good experience, a great way to grow up. Awesome. So what does your involvement, I mean, day to day, what does that look like today um, on the feedlot? Sure. So I manage um one of our 5,000 head feed yards just west of Bridgeport. Um, currently we have four employees up there, which we kind of go from three to four. Um, and then um, we run some grass cattle throughout the summertime. So our feed lot crew kind of shifts that way a little bit. And then we have a cow herd and I oversee the cow herd side of things. And so 
we all just kind of make it work when we're calving, we're calving. When we're in the feedlot, we're in the feedlot. Um, and um, I have some of the feedlot guys and I, we go do the cow stuff and then uh, we just make it work. So we run a pretty tight crew and um, a very, very good crew. I'm blessed to have a good crew with us. And um, so we, we, um, we just get it done at the end of the day. <laughs> well, that's awesome. And so I guess what, um, what's your education background? Like, were there steps in between high school and returning to the family feedlot? Like what, what were those yeah. in between stages? Um, I went to school at Colorado State University. Um, I got a, a degree in agricultural business. Um, and then let's see, I graduated on a Saturday and I started working on a Monday. So <laughs> that was kind of the steps in between was just, um, being in Fort Collins for four years, which was fantastic. And, um, learned a lot there, networked a lot there. And, um, it's been a, it's been a really good path. So for you, was there, did you ever think about going to a different segment of the beef industry other than feedlot? Did you, or, you know, did you think about cow calf? Did you think about being on the business side or what really drove you to, yes, I want to stay in the feedlot side? Um, you know, I enjoy the feedlot. I enjoy the pace of the feedlot. Uh, you know, it's kind of addicting having, um, getting cattle in, getting cattle out, making, filling pens. It's a, you know, 365 job, but the pace is a little bit quicker than on the cow calf side, but with us having the cow herd and the ability to be a part of that, um, that kind of helps, um, you know, once you get to about January, you're kind of ready to get out of the feedlot a little bit. And so we're starting to shift out and, move cows around and get some yearlings in and get out in the grass. And so then you kind of get an opportunity to get out of the feedlot when those numbers get down quite a bit and um, spend most of my days out doing other things. So um, I never really thought about going somewhere else and working. Um, I did do some other experiences in uh, college. I worked for a guy who had oh, about eight ranches throughout Colorado and Wyoming. And um, so I had a lot of experience there with him. And then certified AI through college. So little stuff like that, that I, I um, had the opportunity to take advantage of while I was there kind of helped broaden my uh, experiences in the industry. Well, awesome. So really, and this kind of goes back to what we talked about on that Ranch Mind call. So for those yeah. who aren't familiar, like that Ranch Mind call was um, Cassie was on there as well as three other representatives from different feedlots, but it really allowed ranchers to ask questions to feedlot owners and cattle buyers but really you know Cassie you brought up what I think is pretty neat and other people experience it too but that's where you have the cow calf side and the feedlot as well so how has being involved and having a stake in both the segments made you think differently about each segment or maybe manage differently yeah I mean uh, that's a that's that's a good question. Um, you know, we calve in the fall. So my, so we just weaned all of our calves and it's, you know, in February we weaned everything. So we're kind of on and off, um, away from the fall run, but you know, my having your own cow herd, you'd think a closed herd that the calves don't, you know, they don't travel more than 20 miles until they go to the packing plant. Um, you know, we have our own health issues that we're trying to address. We, uh, we take care of our cows pretty well um, and we keep them on mineral. We keep precondition the calves they are fully vaccinated. Um, and, you know, we still have health issues in the feedlot. So it's really hard to sit back and, <laughs> you know, blame. it's you just have health issues coming to the feedlot. And so that's really good to kind of um, understand that um, it's it, you just don't there's so many external environmental factors that you can't control and um so you just got to figure out a way to do the best you can and get get through your day with it but um it has been beneficial I guess just to understand what the cow calf guys go through and then it's been good to uh to be able to communicate back to the cow, to the rancher, you know, I understand <laughs> you guys have a coward. I understand what you guys are going through as well. And, um, kind of bridge that gap a little bit. It's been, uh, it's been beneficial. So when you talk about bridging that gap, um, 
you know, we talk about having relationships within different segments. So Mm -hmm. what would you say are some of those key steps or key points for ranchers to develop good relationships with feedlots or maybe a feedlot that their calves have been returning to? Absolutely. So, yeah. So if you know, if as a rancher, if, if you know where your calves are going to go, um, a, it's very helpful on our end to know what the history of your calves, um, knowing what they are vaccinated with and when, um, a little bit of the mineral program, but just understanding what these calves have already had prior to coming to the feedlot. Um, not all feedlots care. Some just have a basic protocol and they follow that and that's how they go. Um, for me, if I have the information based off of when they get to the feed yard, I might um, adjust my protocols here. So that's helpful. Um, and then I would say to any rancher, if you know where your calves have gone, um, you know, come February, March, go take a look at what your calves look like um, after they've been on feed for quite a while and see how they've changed or understand, you know, what the what happened in the feedlot level and ask questions and understand the challenges that we had or challenges we didn't have. Maybe they were a great set of calves and, um, and try to just, uh, the transparency I think is getting better um, as younger generations come, come about and there's opportunity to transfer that data back and forth. Well, awesome. So, you know, when you talk about, you know, go see those calves, like what, or maybe let me rephrase that backing up a little bit here. How can producers, you know, find out which feedlot those calves go to? Because there are different avenues to market calves. Some are selling a little more direct. Some are going through sale barns. Like what does that look like as far as figuring out which feedlot they're ending up at? You know, I, that's not uh, my territory to ask or to understand, but if, um, I'm sure if the rancher asked, you know, the sale barn or video, uh, you know, what happened where those calves went, I'm, I'm sure they'd be more than happy to give that information out. I'm not going to speak for them by any means, but I don't see why it would be an issue to know where they went. Um, you know, some, some of the guys just dump them at the sale barn and walk away and get a check and don't really care too. So um, just the communication with the sale barn it would be my first, would be the first step that I would say. Awesome. So shifting gears a little bit, you know, you talked about how, well, you know, come look at your calves later because they change a lot. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of change that those calves go through. So what did those first few weeks look like for a new set of calves in the feedlot? So, you know, depending on the time of year, but primarily most calves arrive October, November. And um, a big thing that I think a lot of ranchers have to realize is, yeah, you know, we get your calves in, but at the same time in that week, we might get 3000 calves from, you know, 10 other different ranches. And, um, and so you're limited on your resources and you're limited on your staff. And, um, that fall run, I mean, people at the feedlots, they're, they're getting calves in throughout the entire night. Um, they're receiving calves. And so you've got weaned calves, you've got balling calves, you have, um, you know, you're starting to get some sickness going. So uh, the weather can be a challenge. And so just understanding what happens at the feedlot level, a lot of it is just these guys start to get pretty beat up and wore out, especially if you're short staffed on just what's happening in those um, 45 to 60 days. And um, once they get into the feedlot, um, every feedlot's different, protocols are different, but um, for us, if it's a calf that just came off its mom, I like to let them settle down for about a week, um, get kind of comfortable, a little less stress on them to kind of get, to make sure that vaccine works a little bit more efficiently in them. Um, However, in a lot of feedlots, that's feedlots, that's not the case. They, they don't have the manpower or the time or the opportunity to hold them back. They have to get them processed and take home because they're running short on receiving pens or um, running short on people. And they have a a short amount of time frame to get those calves worked and processed. Um, So typically the first couple of weeks, those calves come in, they, they get processed and taken home and, um, and um, after that you get about typically about three weeks. And that's when it's kind of make or break for a calf. If they 
uh, get up to that 21 days and they're still staying healthy, then you're probably pretty good throughout the feeding period. But at about day 21, the odds of that calf or that pen of calves getting sick can, it can vary, but hopefully they don't. But mo more times than not, you kind of, you'll see, that's where you'll see the sickness start to sit in. Okay, so really looking at that now, so you set up to like day 21. Now you look at calves as they, some may finish quicker, faster. Are you splitting groups up depending on how they're finishing, what they're weighing, like how many times, you know, what does that kind of process look like up through the finishing period? Um, we don't typically, uh, especially if they're ranch direct, they should, if they come in off of a video, they should, or, you know, off an auction barn, they should be weight sorted up pretty good at the auction barn. Um, and so we try to get a more consistent weight group um, of calves coming through. Now, if we come in and there is um, high volatility in the weight and enough calves uh, to sort into a group or two, we definitely will. It really helps on, you know, that, especially on that lighter end, um, the competition that they takes that competition away from the bunk with a bigger calf, you know, where they're a little more aggressive and are able to get to the bunk a little harder. So um, if the opportunity is there, we definitely will sort them. Um, but we, like I said, try to get a more consistent group of calves and that, that narrows that marketing window up for that group. And we keep them together through the entire feeding period. Well, awesome. So kind of going into some more big picture questions to pick your brain, brain about, is there any one thing or multiple things you wish ranchers would do a little bit differently from your side and perspective on the feedlot? Um, you know, as long as they, they have a good vaccination program, um, try not to skimp on those, on your mineral program, especially I think people in, um, in different years, they, they try to skimp on that, on mineral, especially to their cows. I think that that can hurt us in the end. Um, as we kind of talked on the rancher mind, um, you know, reputation can get pretty big in a sale barn and, um, uh, coming to us, we really just want a healthy calf that's, um, you know, consistent, even set of calves and the calves stay healthy and um, feed well through the, the, the feeding period. And um, if you start to get that and build that one year to the next, then those calves add, it adds value to the calves uh, that, that you guys are raising on the ranch side. Um, but one thing in particular, I don't, I mean, you know, most people do a pretty good job of raising that their their calves and um so i yeah i hope that answers what you're kind of looking for yeah um so you've brought this up twice in the past 10 minutes or so but you talk about the mineral program so mm -hmm. why do you care about you know what are the impacts of skimping on a mineral program on the cow calf side how is that impacting you uh health at the, in the feedlot you know if if the calves if the cows didn't get the health um the mineral throughout the gestation period that calf is already starting out behind just in um the minerals that they need themselves and then once you know once they get once they're born and you you take that away from them they're they're licking in the tubs just as much as a cow is and um you just don't want to if you start the calf already behind um them catching up as they go along um usually isn't the case they're just they're always just a step behind the healthier calves that have been fully um, had access to full mineral. Okay. So looking at the next five to 10 years, what's one thing you are excited to see in the beef industry, whether that's technology wise, relationship wise, like what are you excited about for the future of our industry? Yeah, I think um, with COVID, um, the Holcomb fire with Tyson, I think, you know, us as feedlot people have understood that there are a lot of um, issues on that end. And I think people realize that it's, it's time to stand up and change and we need to find a way to come together and change. And um, I mean, this truly impacted a lot of ranchers uh, and a lot of cattle feeders. And I think we're trying to figure out ways to, to, you know, be in more control about what our product, where our product goes next. Um, I think there's that it's created, created a lot of opportunity for that. 
I also think with the technology and the transparency, um, you know, consumers, I know it's been said for a while, they want to know where their food comes from, but I think we're starting to find the technologies and the opportunities to start at a ranch level and promote, um, promote those ranchers and, and um, showcase what they do. Um, I think we're starting to actually push forward with that a lot more. And I think in the next five to 10 years, we're going to be able to uh, come back and identify um, you know, a piece of steak and say, oh, it was born on this ranch by this person and their picture comes up. So a lot of opportunity there. Um, it, it, people get pretty bleak on the next generations coming back, but my experience here in the Western part of Nebraska is uh, there, there are a lot of kids and families wanting to come back and raise their kids in agriculture. And um, so we have to create opportunities to be able to make sure that they can make a living um, and feed their families at the end of the day in this in this industry because it's a fantastic way to grow up. Well, I'd agree with that on two fronts. One, the traceability side and that there are a lot of opportunities in agriculture for the next generation to come back. Me being that generation and seeing my friends and myself want to do that, you know, we want to come back. Perfect. So with that, you know, you talked about how people are recognizing that there needs to be a shift for change, you know, with COVID and all that arose there. What mindset do you think ranchers and feedlots need to develop to start making those changes, start adapting those technologies and moving forward? Um, uh, you know, I think like for us, what we've been talking about a lot is just the E like an EID and, and of it, individual animal identification system. Um, there's so many different programs out there, but we're specifically as a family trying to sit down and figure out, you know, whether it be on a blockchain model, um, just a software program that transfers data back into the feedlot automatically. Um, but I think starting to, to individually identify those animals from the ranch is a big, big deal um, and a change for a lot of the ranchers there. Um, and then I think just the value of transferring the data back to the rancher is immense. I mean, if they start to understand, you know, um, where they can do better, if they can do better, uh, that just makes the industry as a whole and the quality of these animals, um, better moving forward. And, um, I think people want to do good. Everybody's proud of the, the quality of calves that they pass along to the feedlot. And so, um, if, if there's an area of opportunity uh, to get better, I think, I think they want to at the end of the day and it's just communicating that back and forth to one another. Well, that's awesome, Cassie. Do you have any parting thoughts you'd like to share as we wrap up today? You know, I, I really don't. I think um, what you're doing, Shay, is great. I think um, helping on on both levels on understanding you know for us maybe there's something we're not doing to help the ranchers out and and if they want to reach out ever and um if we can help them in any way um bridging this gap is just a great great thing and i think this program is is great so thank you very much and that's a wrap on that one folks thank you for tuning in to another episode of casual cattle conversations and thank you cassie for being a part of this show and the overall business in this program um, it's been great to hear her insight and i hope you all receive some value out of that and have your wheels turning in your mind about what the future of the beef industry looks like on the traceability front and how you can build your own relationships with individuals within the next segment of the beef industry outside of just the cow calf side. So with that, I hope to hear have you listen to the next one folks and you have a great day.